as you give and stand and just worship with us. Continue to worship.
powerful name is nothing can stand against what a powerful name it is the name of Jesus nothing can stand against the name of Jesus I love the line of that song where it says death could not hold you that's this moment, this moment we're about to celebrate, this act of worship we're about to participate in in this time is the death of our Savior, the broken body, the shed blood. It's an important distinction to note about the death of Jesus. Is his life was not taken from him. His life was given. He gave himself freely. The power that Jesus had when he was asked about getting himself off of the cross, the power he had wasn't to get himself off the cross. The power he had was to keep himself on the cross. He possessed the power to stay there for you and for me. To have his body broken, to have his blood shed for you and for me. We love you, Lord. We're so grateful that you had the power to withstand all of the sin of mankind. You were able to endure. We were unworthy, Father, but you are so worthy. You are worthy, Lord. You are holy. You so loved us. You weren't content with us perishing, but that we would remain in your embrace for all of eternity, near you, in your presence, with you, Father. You love us. In Luke 22, starting in verse 19, it says, And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. It's given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty six says, this is us proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Here we are telling about the Lord's death, what he did for us, the love that he had for us. And this is a moment that we need to look inward. We need to examine ourselves. Are we with sin? Are we with unforgiveness? Because the Lord says that we drink judgment. We eat and drink judgment upon ourselves if we do this unworthily. So it's time to repent in this moment before we partake. Lord, reveal to us, Father, reveal the sin to us. Reveal the people in our lives, God, that we need to forgive, Father. And in this moment, this is the community of believe, believers that God has divinely placed you in the presence of in this moment. If you look around and you think, why did he put me here in this moment with these people? It's because that was part of his plan. This is the community he desires for you to belong to. This is the moment he desires for you to be in right now with these believers partaking in the cup and the bread. This is that moment. And here's this declaration that this is our future. This body that was broken, this blood that was shed, that wasn't the end. There was a resurrection. There is new life for us. We look to the future. We look to the second coming of our dear Savior. Father, thank you for giving your Son to us, for taking our place, for taking on our sins so that we didn't have to bear the consequence of those sins, God, but that he would atone for the sin of mankind. We are so thankful. We were so unworthy. You did this work for us out of your extensive, immense love for your creation. We love you, Lord. This morning, we identify symbolically in the broken body and the shed blood. Let us remember what you did for us. 
let us remember what you did for us, but let us also look forward to the return of the Savior, the return of the Son. Thank you. As this next song begins, just you or those of you who are going to help us uh, pass out the elements, you could come forward if if you would at this time. And as this song plays, just if you would line up in the aisles and just kind of come down and and partake in that moment. But don't just just take it out of ritual. Examine, examine yourself. Think about what God's done. This is that moment. is my day.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> oh, bless the Lord. Bless the Lord. Father, the song says it all. We're desperate for you. We are absolutely lost without you. We're not telling you anything you don't already know. We're acknowledging the fact. We're identifying with that. We're saying, yes, Lord, we desperately need you in this hour know where to turn. We don't know where to walk. We don't know what to do. We're lost without you. God, with you, you're giving us direction. Your voice is speaking to us. Your word is clear. We follow the movement of your spirit in our lives, God. And we give you praise. We honor you and bless you. You are the air we breathe. <laughs> Thank you, Lord. You're our very bread that we eat. Thank you, Lord, for life. Thank you for this time at the table just to worship you. <clears throat> Lord, we pray for those at home right now and in hospital rooms and nursing homes. Maybe they're watching today. Maybe they're not. But, Lord, you know every one of them, our friends, our loved ones. And we speak blessing over them now. We just pray that your word would go and heal them and touch them and raise them up physically, emotionally, spiritually. Let them receive your healing virtue. We pray for everybody watching, Lord, whether, regardless of where they are now, that the Spirit of God would touch them. The same spirit that's been evident in our communion time here at this table in this building would just be evident in their lives right now. Supernaturally touch them, I pray, in Jesus' name. Restore hope. Restore courage. Restore victory, Lord. A sense of what has been lost in their lives. Restore it and bring it back, I pray, a hundredfold in the name of the Lord Jesus. And everybody said amen. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you as you're seated this morning. <clears throat> amen. What a joy it is to worship this morning and be led by uh, Amber. Amber Keith, my daughter-in-law. And um, this takes me back a ways, Amber, a few years ago. Amber was our worship leader when we were downtown in the old building on 14th Street. And then she and Michael moved away to Texas and and boy, am I glad they're back now. What a blessing uh, this couple is to our church. Hey, man, would you agree with that? Praise God. Praise God. Hey, Amen. So thanks, Amber, for leading in uh, Sherry's absence today. And um, <clears throat> now she's going to shift gears and put on her children's church hat. She goes from worship leader to children's director, okay? So I guess it's time. Are you ready, Amber? You caught your breath? All right. All the boys and girls here, 4 through 12, make your way upstairs. Would you please right up this way? There they go. My goodness, that's a bunch of kids. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Bless you, dear. Give them a big hand, everybody. Go ahead. That's all right. Yep. Yep. Good, good, good. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. So, so Wednesday night here at the church, 6 o'clock, ladies' Bible study. If you ladies are getting in on that, you know what it's like. Really, really special. If you've missed out on it, there's still time to come on, and you can grab a book. You can jump in anywhere. Um, my wife, Glenda, is leading. Glenda isn't home today. She, um, she uh, overdid it yesterday. We had a uh, reception for um, w one of our 
some of our kids, a couple of our kids were celebrating an anniversary, a wedding anniversary yesterday, and we had a little celebration here at the church, and, and um, so Glenda just absolutely overdid it. This morning, she says, I can't move. I said, I know the feeling. How many of you know the feeling when you wake up in the morning, you can't move, right? Yeah, yeah. I call it dry cereal. It's snap, crackle, and pop. That's what everything sounds like when I get out of bed, snap, crackle, and pop. Well, she's at home, so remember her in prayer. She's, she's not ill, but uh, she is totally uh, run out, okay? I didn't do it. She did it herself. <laughs> I'll blame her for it. But um, you know how it is. Sometimes we just overdo it. So, so please pray for her. Uh, let's see. Also, I'm, i got to mention, one week from tomorrow is our minister's meeting here at the church. Uh, every year, we host a one-day event for Independent Assemblies ministers. And these guys and ladies could be, they could be pastors, they could be uh, church leaders, uh, they could be children's workers, youth workers, you name it. Uh, they're all coming to our, our place from all over the state, and it's our time to host them. So, it's a tremendous opportunity for you guys and us guys to show great hospitality to men and women of God. And every one of these folks that we minister to, uh, they, they have folks in their care. You know, 10, 20, 50, 100, uh, 300, whatever their, whatever their ministry uh, outreach is. And so we'll be blessing a lot of folks by blessing the minister. You say, well, I'm not a minister. I don't know what to do. I'll just stay home. It's a Monday. Listen, we would love to have you come and help us. We need help. All right, we need your help. We're going to be serving a meal uh, at 530. We're going to be hosting a fellowship hospitality table. We're going to be setting up tables, chairs, greeting people, making sure the restrooms are clean, plenty of toilet paper, all those kinds of issues when you've got a house full of people all day. So it starts at 2 o'clock, 2.30, and then uh, there's an afternoon session at 4. And so Michael speaks at 2.30. I speak at 4. And then our friend Jerry Edmond will be speaking at 6.30. He'll be driving up from Austin uh, for the meeting. And so three sessions, three teaching sessions, great inspiration, teaching of the Word. And we hope that you'll be with us uh, for that and you'll help us uh, work in the kitchen. Uh, look, looks like there's, is that a sign-up sheet? Okay, where's that going to be, Sabrina? In the lobby. Okay, so if you can help us, sign up. Let us know uh, on that there sheet and uh, uh, tell us you'll be here next Monday. Now, if I get back here today and don't see your name on the sheet, I'll probably just go ahead and sign you up anyway. So you might as well, you might as well just sign up, okay? And uh, we'll, we'll have a great, great time. We only do this once a year, and so let's, let's make it a great one, okay? Let's put the effort into it uh, for, um, let's see, what day is that, the 14th? Yeah, 14th. Excellent. All right. It's my, t- it's my privilege this morning to introduce our speaker today. Uh, Jackie Caton is going to be speaking for us. Jackie uh, and his wife Cheryl are a very, very special part of our church. We love them dearly. We love the pastoral call on their lives. And um, Jackie's here to open the Word of God. So why don't you just open your heart and open your Bibles as uh, Jackie comes to share a word he's prepared from the Lord. Let's give him a welcome this morning, everybody. Amen. Hey man, God's good. Is God good? God's good, isn't he? He is. Uh, we had a song this morning that was sing first. That, uh, go ahead and put that verse up if you would. There's a verse. Book of Isaiah, chapter 1. This is in the NIV, but if you look at it in any translation, it's very close to this. In, in the KJV, you can leave it up. That's fine. In the KJV, the one that I started out with many, many years ago, and many of us did, I'm, I'm liable to use just about any kind of, any translation. I don't have a problem with hardly any of them. I just, it's the Word of God. And I believe that God can use it in our lives, no matter how man tries to mess it up. But this is the Word of God as it came to Isaiah. So Isaiah is just, God is speaking through him. And God says, come now to his people. Let me just set this up right quick. Isaiah said this and lived. His ministry occurred about 700 years before Christ, before the cross, before the life of Jesus. 
before God sent his son to this world. And during that 80 to 90 years, oh, between then and uh, 700 B.C., God called about four different prophets, Amos and some others. And it was just like, boom, 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 one after another. That had not occurred in history with prophets being so close together. But again, Israel, like we, had gotten away from God, worshiping idols. God had blessed them. They were wealthy beyond belief. They had peace all around them, and they got away from God. They forgot him somewhere in there. This is so easy for all of us to do. So God spoke through Isaiah and said, come now, let us settle the matter. Or another translation says reason together. God actually called for a conversation with his people. And he said, come here, let me talk to you. Let's negotiate. Let's speak together. God said, come, come to me. And he said, though your, skin, your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And as so often happens until God just, and they did end up going into captivity. One of the sad things is immediately after this, well, Isaiah had already answered the call. God said, who will, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, pick me. He was miserable from the condition of the country. He was miserable. God had they thought God had forsaken them, but as, usually, as always happens, they had forsaken God. And God said, come to me. So Isaiah came to God. Uh, and a very tragic thing happened. He said, God said, okay, so I've got a ministry for you. I've got sermons for you to preach. And he said, <clears throat> okay, as this, we always want to qualify our condition, God. He said, how long? Listen carefully. God said, and this is in the scripture, God said, until the city is empty. He said, they're not going to listen. Are you listening to God today? I know Christian after Christian. I love you. I love God's people. I would not rather, I would rather be here than anywhere in my life today. I love you. You have, this church has so readily accepted us and loved us. I feel more loved here than I have felt in decades. As sad as that is, I really do feel loved here. Cheryl and I, we talk about that regularly at home. So wonderful to feel love around God's people. But he told Isaiah, he said, I'll tell you up front, he said, they're not going to listen. So are you listening this morning? I know so many Christians who say, well, God doesn't say anything to me. I know a man, a wealthy man, wealthy man. Uh, says he's a Christian. I, I don't know. I love him, but we were talking one day, and he said, you know, I'm thinking about starting a church or about uh, teaching a Sunday school class. I want to teach. I said, well, what's God telling you to do? Listen to me. He said, well, God doesn't say anything to me. He said that. I would be scared to death to do something God didn't tell me to do. Do you, do you know, some people say, well, how does he speak to you? Are you listening? That's the problem. It's not how he speaks. It's the problem is, are you listening? Because you've got to get still. You've got to get quiet and listen. To, as some of the sermons here lately, Brother Michael, Brother Daniel, Brother Charles, and others, Brother Jerry, are you listening? Because he always speaks. The father talks to his children, doesn't he? The father talks to his Michael, don't you talk to your kids? I, I texted one of my sons this morning. I still talk to my kids. Sometimes I don't know why, but I'm kidding. But uh, I, I texted one of them this morning and said, keep me in prayer, be preaching this morning. He said, done, Dad. Not all of my children are serving God. Not all of them are saved. They were all raised in the same household, but not all of them are serving him. Please pray for my kids that aren't. Amen. Thank you. I'm going to sing this song. It's called The Invitation. And then we'll get into the sermon. <coughs> And are we good? good? Okay. In the palace in the land of mercy, King looked down from his throne. He saw the 
the sick and the homeless and the hungry saw them lost and without a Moved with compassion, he sent out his own son. With the invitation, This is your invitation. Come just the way you are. Come find what your soul has been longing for. Come find your peace. Come join the feast. This is your invitation. So I stood outside the gates and trembled in my rags of unworthiness. Afraid to even stand at a distance in the presence of holiness. But just as I turned to go, the gate swung open wide, and the king and his only son, they invited me inside. This is your invitation. Come just the way you are. Come find what your soul has been longing for. Come find your peace. Come join the feast. Come in. This is your invitation. So now will you come with me to where the gates swing open wide? The king and his only son are inviting us inside. This is your invitation. Come, sinner, as you are. Come find what your soul has been longing for. Come find your peace. Come join the peace. Come in. This is your invitation. This is our invitation. This is the invitation. my age, you don't waste words. Some of you are going to end up in hell. Some of you out there, maybe, maybe some of us in here. Just because you've come to church this morning doesn't mean you're going to heaven. The only way you're going to heaven is if Jesus Christ is the Lord of your life. You say, oh yeah, I heard about him. Or, Boy, I went to a good conference and it was a good conference and I felt the presence of God, but you're not listening. You're not listening to him. 
you're not welcome. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. And another, they will not hear. Some people are just, they're just running through life, listening to their flesh, going here, going there, doing this, doing that. <clears throat> I'll talk about Jesus in a little while. Is that okay? That's pretty good, isn't it? Surely I can't mess up talking about Jesus. <clears throat> this is something someone else wrote. He is the first and the last. Listen carefully. The beginning and the end. He is the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He is the architect of the universe and is the manager of all times. He always was, he always is, he always will be. Unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, and never undone. He was bruised and he brought healing. He was pierced and he eased our pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and he brought life. He's risen and he brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him. They don't want to. The armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him and the people couldn't hold him. Nero couldn't crush him. Hitler couldn't silence him. The New Age can't replace him and non-believers can't explain him away. Herod couldn't kill. I went back to it, didn't I? I like that part, especially. He is light, love, longevity, and Lord. He is goodness, kindness, gentleness, and God. He is holy, righteous, mighty, powerful, and pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging. And his mind is upon his people. He is my redeemer. He is my savior. He is my guide, and he is my peace. Amen. He is my joy, he is my comfort, he is my Lord, and he rules my life. I serve him because his bond is love, his burden is light, his goal for me is abundant life. I follow him because he is the wisdom of the wise, the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders, the overseer of the overcomers, and the sovereign Lord of all that was and is and is to come. And if that is not impressive in us to you, try this on for size, his goal is a relationship with each one of us. God doesn't go by proxy. You can't come here and get it through the person you're sitting next to. You have to come to an altar somewhere. It may not be down here. It might be by your bed at night. It might be by the commode in your bathroom. I'm serious. God will meet you. If he can ever get you to meet him, God will meet you where he can get you to stop. And you know what? The sad thing is, if you never stop, you won't spend an eternity where I'm planning on spending it. You know who's it? Just quickly, can anybody in here tell me right quick, hell is a horrible place. We don't talk about it, right? Who, ha who out of all history, can anybody in here tell me who had the most to say about hell than anybody that ever lived? Preachers, you want to jump in? Jesus. Jesus said more about hell than all the prophets in the Old Testament. You know why? Because he doesn't want you to go there. Jesus is, his cross was preventative. Preventative is better than after the fact, right? Sometimes you can't fix the mess. You're preventative. Jesus came to prevent you from going to hell. And me. He will never leave me, never forsake me, never mislead me, never forget me, never overlook me, and never cancel my appointment in his appointment book. When I fall, he lifts me up. When I fail, he forgives. When I am weak, he is strong. When I am lost, he is the way. When I am afraid, he is my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I am hurt, he heals me. When I am broken, he mends me. When I am blind, he leads me. When I am hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he is with me. But Jesus went one better. He said, I will be inside of you. I will be in you. When I face persecution, he shields me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he will carry me home. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. He is God. He is faithful. I am his and he is mine. God is in control. I have moved over to his side. That means that all is well with my soul. He's good. I'll tell you a few, uh, as I was sitting and thinking about that one day, just portions of scripture 
Old Testament, New Testament that talked about who Jesus is began to come to my mind. I started writing them down, and here's the ones that I wrote down. That I just I know there's more because I could just remember these from Scripture. They just came to mind. I, I'm not gonna. I don't have the uh, text, but I can assure you they're there. If we need to look them up, we can after service. I will not preach something that's not. Matter of fact, Brother Mickey or uh, one of you other ministers, if I say something, you say, that doesn't sound what right, you just jump in, okay? We're talking about new beginnings. That, that really spurred me. I don't know where you're going to be in this, Daniel. Daniel, you might get to do the cleanup on this again like you did last month. We'll just leave you with nothing, you know? But uh, you did a wonderful job. Amen to the sermons I heard last month. I just want to tell you, church, I am the oldest one. I've been in, not in ministry longer than some, but I've been in church all my life. I've never heard better preaching. I've never heard more studied men in my life than what we have in this church. He is the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is wonderful, he is counselor, he is mighty God, he is the bread of life, he is the water of life, he's the everlasting God, he's the Alpha and the Omega, he's the beginning and the end, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the I Am, King of kings and Lord of lords, Messiah, Son of man, Light of the world, True Vine, Way, the truth and the life, the resurrection and the life, Son of man, Son of God, friend of sinners, Lord of the harvest, awesome God, Savior of the world, our reward, the good shepherd, the door of the sheep, the breath of life, my Lord and my God, the Christ, the Son of the living God, the image of the invisible God, firstborn over all creation, head of the body, the church, the bridegroom, firstborn from the dead, the express image of God's person, the propitiation for our sins. He became sin. Who knew no sin? He actually became your sins on the cross, my sins on the cross. He was called a cursed, a lamb led to the slaughter, an offering for our sin, a tender plant, a root out of dry ground, the arm of the Lord, despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows, servant, righteous servant, Lord of all, the brightness of his glory, heir of all things, and the rose of Sharon, and there's more. And I don't have those. These are just ones that came to mind. I didn't look them up. I know they're there. Now I want to go to 2 Corinthians 5 and 17 for just a little bit. If you want to get your Bibles or I didn't give the scripture to uh, Sister Sabrina, but if you want to look it up, we're going to read a little there and tell you what's on my heart. I haven't really told you what's on my heart yet this morning. Just kind of got me started. Second Corinthians chapter five. Is everybody okay? You all right? If you're okay, raise your hand. All right. God's been good this morning. I'll try not to mess it up. God's very strong, very powerful in our worship this morning. I'm very grateful for that. As you're there at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, a couple more things. In the last 50 years, I'll give you some facts. I like the way Daniel used that and, and Michael does. Too. I think everybody, we kind of got used to the internet and Google and all them and the way you use those facts and things that we learn. In the last 50 years, there have been 3.9 billion in the last 50 years, three point, this is a matter of fact, 3.9 billion Bibles sold throughout the world. The next book in line that sold was 820 million. So that's like, so just about a fifth of as many as the Bible. And I, that was some ruler who was a horrible person who killed a lot of his people. And the next one after that was 400 million for Harry Potter. Interesting. Um, books written about Jesus easily number into the tens of thousands. 
No one else get close, even gets close. No one gets close throughout history. A man said, J. Barton Payne said that by his study of the Old Testament, there's no less than 574 verses in the Old Testament that either point to directly, describe, or reference, or, or somehow intimate the coming of a Savior, Jesus. Over 300 prophecies were fulfilled when Jesus was born, lived, died, and was resurrected. Actually, over 324 by another count. Peter Stoner, look, let me give you this. This is a little mind bender. I, I don't want us to get too exhausted with our brains. But Peter Stoner said that if just 48 of the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled, were true, if just 48 of those were fulfilled, the chances of that happening would be one followed by 10 times 157. So that would be a one followed by 157 zeros. The point is there is no mistaking that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. It's more sure that Jesus lived than that all of us are sitting here this morning. It's a fact. You say, well, I know I'm here. Jesus said in John 5 and 39, and don't turn there, he said, he told some people, he said, you search the scriptures looking for eternal life, to live forever, to go to, go to back then, I don't know if they talked about heaven that much, but it was the kingdom of light, and so many references to other, other things. He said, you, you search the scriptures looking for eternal life. He said, and they're they which testify of me. Of course, he was talking about the Old Testament because that's all they had. He said, all of them speak of me. I got a little something for you. Just, just going to throw this in this morning. Um, this, I, like I said, I'm, I can be kind of mean. I'm not really a mean person, but I'm, I think, Cheryl, am I pretty much of a realist? I'm very some. I'm going to tell you, y'all, if y'all think I'm confusing, then you can, my, my wife knows exactly how you feel. My wife has three words that describe me. You going to tell them? You know? Three words. You confuse me. That's what she says. You confuse me. You know? And I, I, I'm good at that. <clears throat> the Bible says that God has a he's one of the peculiar people well sometimes he just has downright weird people you know strange Second Corinthians chapter 5 <clears throat> we'll start at verse uh, I think 16 talking about new beginnings. Sometimes every day is a new beginning for me. You know, when you get up in the morning, the first thing you do is take a pain pill, and two hours later you take another one. Todd, you might empathize with that, because I know after you're now, I'll tell you, this guy's a hero to me. When I had, and, uh, Sandy said he complains a little, whines a little, but I, I was on crutches and a walker for, you know, a month after I had mine, and he walks into church two weeks later on his knee, and I'm like, wow. Because I can tell you the pain from a from a knee replacement is just amazing. How'd you like everybody like a little bit of medical science right quick? I'm gonna give you this. You can get online and, and uh, check it out. And what they do when they replace your knee, it's not nice and simple. They literally go in here to avoid cutting all the the tendons and muscles. They go in here and they they bend your leg double after they put you out. Of course, I mean they give you some good anesthesia. I've had several surgeries in my life, so I'm, I'm, I don't have a problem with good anesthesia. I'm like, give me all you can. You know, don't wake me up any sooner than you have to. They literally bend your leg double, not like you do if you squat down. They bend it so it's right, your, your heel is right back here. I mean, it's just, 
and then they pull all the muscles and the tendons, everything off to the side, and then they go in, they, they cut off the bone, this part of the bone, right up here, the joint, and they cut it off down here, then they drill a big hole in it, both sides, right? Some of you, I get, you're going like, you know, and those of you that aren't, you're shaking your head, you don't, you know, thank God they can do it, Brother Todd. We don't have to quit yet, do we? I had both of mine years ago. I'm so thankful for them. But then they cut those off. They put those new joints in. They cement them in with something that's not supposed to ever turn loose. And then they take a mallet and they whack them down into that bone. You know? And then later, hopefully, a couple of days later, when you wake up, uh, did, you, did you get the nerve block? Because they've got a nerve block they can do that. You wake up and you don't even feel it till the next day. And you're like, well, this is not bad. I can do this, you know. And then the next day the nerve block wears off and you're like, you know, and, you, and your wife is rationing the pain meds and you have to find where she has them stashed. No, Cheryl didn't do that. She just gave me the pain meds and said, you know, ouch, yeah. Anyway, just a little thing. <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5. <laughs> Did I say anything that wasn't true, Todd? It's all tried, isn't it? This man's a hero. But, so if you go in, I'm, I'm trying to get you ready. So if you go in and get a knee replacement after watching him, you think, that's easy. Mm -mm. No. A lot different. Okay. Second Corinthians chapter 5. I'm going to get really serious right now for just a few minutes. Let's, let's bow our heads and pray for just a minute. Father, as we kind of had some fun, we've joked. God, we've talked about who Jesus is. And we're talking about new beginnings. Father, there's probably someone here this morning, maybe several, that need to make a new beginning. There's people watching online. God, they need to make a new beginning. Maybe they accepted Christ years ago. They need to make a new beginning. They need to come back. Like I do sometimes daily, running from my flesh, coming to the Father. So my flesh won't devour me, so that I won't keep my mind off of you lose what you're trying to give me and do in my life. Pray for those watching and listening this morning. God, let them hear your word. Let them feel your presence. Let them hear your voice speaking to them this morning, calling to them, come to me. Let's work this out. Let's reason together. Understand you don't have to go to hell. You don't have to perish. You can have eternal life because of my son. The invitation is there daily, and some will put it off so long, they'll never get it. Bless your word this morning. Forgive me if I take away from it. Father, help me not to interfere in what you're trying to do in the lives and hearts and minds of people who are listening this morning. Maybe people that, maybe a couple of my children who aren't even within 100 miles of me this morning. God, that they'll feel your presence in a very real, palpable, strong way. Ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Second Corinthians chapter five, verse sixteen through nineteen. Therefore, from now on, we this is talking about God's people, his people, the Christians, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Jesus, we don't they, they were saying, We don't know him in the flesh. He's not here. They said Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their, trans their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. That's what we're doing this morning. We're hoping and praying this morning that as the worship has been powerful and strong, and it was all about Jesus, that as God speaking to your heart this, today, this morning, He wants you to be reconciled to Him. God knows with me. I, I know Cheryl. I confuse her. I can't imagine what I do to God. God probably goes, "Nope, I've got you down just exactly, Jackie. Just short leash. Have your attention constantly." It takes that for some of us. ministry of reconciliation is to reconcile us to God, not him to us. God's not going to change the way he does things. 
He says, I am the same yesterday, today, and forever. God told him in the Old Testament, he said, he told him, he said, you sons of Jacob, Israelites, he said, I change not. That's the only reason I haven't consumed all of you. He tried to do it when Moses was there. God said, I'm just going to wipe them out, Moses. I'm going to give you a people like he did with Abraham. He said, I'm going to start with you. And Moses said, God, don't do that. He said, the nations around would, would ridicule. God said, I'm done. There will come a day. Brother Michael, I'm not in here. He does one of the most wonderful job of telling you how much God loves you that I have ever heard in my life. God has a limit. There will not be sin in heaven. Can I throw this in? Don't, don't take me a little. I just have a thought occasionally. It's a, you know, I'm called Daniel. I guess you and me, we kind of do it. It's just ADHD. I don't know what it is, but I'll have a thought. In the book of Malachi, don't get upset on me and, and don't say this is anybody else's idea but mine. You think there's going to be any thieves in heaven? There's not. I'll just tell you. If you read the scripture, the Bible says very plainly in the last chapters of Revelation, no thieves, no idolaters, no murderers, no rapists, no, 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 no. And then no liars. If you're used to telling white lies, quit. That's a lie, right? Don't do it to make somebody feel good. Just give them the truth and let them deal with it because that's what God does. He gives us the truth, doesn't he? He says, you're lost. You are a sinner. You need to be saved. That's the truth. That's the reality of it. So don't, don't lie. So I'm just wondering, if thieves don't go to heaven, can somebody that doesn't tithe go to heaven? It's just a thought. I'm not saying that. I don't preach that. It's the first time I've ever said it to a group of people. But I'm just wondering because God said the tithe is mine. I'm not trying to get you to do something you don't think's right. But I'm just saying. You know what happened right after God said that? He quit talking for 400 years. From the, from the time of Malachi, God said, I'm done. Until Jesus was born. And then God said, I'm still not talking. He said, this is my son. Listen, right? Preachers, is that right? That's what he said. For 400 years before, there was no open vision. There were no prophets. It was quiet. I've known people who, who just before they died, they began, they began to, as a pastor, you go to, to people in ministry, you go to the, the bedside of people in the hospital. Sometimes people you've never met, people that have lived without God. And all of a sudden, they want to know God. They want to be absolved of their sins. They want to go to heaven. They want somebody to say something nice at their funeral. And you know what? God has grown quiet. It gets silent. I'm not being mean. I'm talking reality. The Bible says... God is not willing that any should perish, not one. If you go to hell, you're going to do it. I don't know why. You say, well, I, I, I'm, I'm attached to this, or I'm attached to that person, or I can't leave my way of life. Or I'd have, I've heard people say, you know, and I, I know who they are today. 20 years later, they're still living the way they were. Well, if I, quit, if I started going to church, I'd have to quit doing all the things I like to do. Well, you would probably change liking those things seems to be the way it goes. You would not enjoy those anymore if you came to God. But if you're so attached to Him, you won't even give God a chance. That, that's your choice. I want to say something that, that is not often said. One of the most powerful services that I remember in my life. And if you think it's quiet in here, it was quieter there. I've been to church not too many miles from here. It was probably almost 40 years ago. Literally. I never forgot it. The pastor was preaching and he came to the end of the service and and uh, gave an, was going to give an invitation. He said, he said, I want all of the people who are Christians, he said, I want you to come to the front of the church. And it was a large number. It was a fairly small church. But many people came to the front and they stood at the front of the church. He said, I want you to turn around and look, look out. And it was pretty honest. There were some people who didn't come. And sometimes there are people that will come, well, I don't want to be alone out here, so I'll just go up with them. But they turned around. And he said, I don't want to be mean. He said, but I want you to understand, folks. He said, those of you that are still standing there, and you've been honest enough just to admit that you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, he said, you're not going to live forever with this group of people. 
and you love some of them and they love you, but you don't get that choice. You have to come to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. He said, you've got to start a new life. Some people, you know that as you get older, the chances of you coming to Christ get infinitely smaller and exponentially smaller. People who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, it gets, I mean, it's like one out of 10. If you're lucky, or one out of 20 or 30 when you're 80 and 90 years old. People are so set in their ways. Well, that's scary to me. I'll tell you, hell scares me. If it doesn't, you don't know what it's about. Eternal separation from anybody and everybody. To get back to that service, this is for drama, okay, for effect. There was a fairly young couple sitting three rows back 40 years ago. Burned into my brain, Pastor. You've got services like that, don't you? Burned into your brain when you knew God was calling somebody. About three rows back from that side, Pastor walked down. Took a three-month-old baby out of her arms. And he walked back to the front. And he handed that baby to one of the other ladies. And that lady was standing there. And the, the, the young husband and father, he said, this is the way it's going to be if you don't change, if you don't choose Jesus Christ. This is the way this is going to end. If you have a grandchild upstairs today or a grandbaby down here today or a niece or a nephew here today in junior church and you're not a Christian, when you die, you'll never see them again. That's scripture. That is the word of God. That's a very sad fact. But that's the truth. If you don't come to Jesus Christ, it'll change your life. I won't lie to you. He said you'll be a new creature. Things will begin to change on this side and that side in your life. But I will tell you, you will be filled with such a joy and a peace. That song, Come Find Your Peace. Come join the feast. You know there's going to be two feasts? There's going to be a feast in heaven. There's another one. The other feast is described in the last few chapters of Revelation. The Bible says that whenever whenever the armies are gathered together against God's Holy One, against Jesus, and Jesus rides out on a horse, and his armies are, are behind him, you know, I've, I've, I've always heard people say, well, what, what are we going to fight? How are we going to do it? You don't. You just step in behind Jesus, and it says that he with the word of God, the sword of the spirit will proceed out of his mouth and he'll kill everybody there. Everybody that steps up against Jesus, they'll be destroyed the same way that God created the world with by his word. Don't know how that's going to look. But just before that happens, angels or God calls for all the fowls of the air, all the vultures, all the buzzards, all the hawks, everything. The Bible, the Bible says they call for all of them and says, come on, Come, come, you're going to have a feast. And then after Jesus, after everyone is destroyed, all of his enemies are destroyed, and we're going to heaven. He is triumphant over all. They have a feast. The vultures do over all of those. And that'll be, that could be you. Well, that's not very nice. I'm telling you what the Bible says. There's a lot of people. One of my sisters, and I love my sisters. My two sisters are Christians. I have a younger sister, uh, predated us going to heaven. Looking forward to seeing Sherry again. To love God. One of my sisters told me several years back, well, I just really struggle with reading the Old Testament. I just don't understand how God could kill those people. I said, get ready. It's fixing to happen again. Because God protects and cares for and loves his children. And every time God did something in the Old Testament that might be distasteful to you, it was most usually to protect his children and care for them. He loves us. He will care for us. He will provide for us. I'm going to leave it there. I want you to take that last thought. If Jesus is not these things in your life, the Bible has described him in every way imaginable and possible. So you would come to him, Rose of Sharon, Son of God, wonderful God, all the things 
this is just the first Sunday of preaching on new beginnings. This is a good time to make a new beginning. And I, as pastor has done many times, and un, unhappily and sadly probably will more, Daniel, Michael, Charles Chenault has done. I may stand here this morning and ask you to come to Jesus Christ because if you don't, you'll never see your grandchild, your great-grandchild, your niece, your nephew. You'll never see them again. You're not going to go to heaven on somebody else's coattails. You can't do that. You can't. Some of us may see our grandchildren there and some of our kids won't be there. I don't know how that's going to play out. I know I won't stop praying until... God takes me, but I'm broken every day for some of the people I know, for some of my kids, it's broken. This morning, I'm standing there trying to sing and worship, and I was just broken thinking what they're missing. I don't know if I'm going to have, uh, why don't you, uh, Sabrina, just play the uh, soundtrack to that song just a minute at the invitation. Can I do that, Pastor? Is that okay? <laughs> this is as good an opportunity as you're ever going to have to come to Jesus Christ. I came to Christ out around an old old burn barrel that was sitting up on an old, where they dumped a bunch of concrete after they'd been doing some building, and they set a burn barrel up there later in church camp when I was nine years old, 12, I, between nine and 12. And I came to Jesus. You can do it there. You can do it in your bathroom. You can do it any place you can get quiet and stop. Bow your heads, please. Heavenly Father, I don't know the hearts of anyone. You know the hearts of all of us. This morning, there's someone that needs to come to you and have a new beginning, start their life new. Do they really know you? Are you Lord of all, of every, every decision, of every question, of every answer? This is an opportunity to come to Jesus. Accept him as Lord. Then they can take it home to their children, to their spouse, to their aunts, uncles, nieces, nephews. They can tell others about Jesus. This is the invitation. I pray this morning you won't wait too long. You might say, well, I've made it a long time now. I've made it, I've made it this many years. I can, I can make it a few more. I can make it another Sunday. It'll be next time. It'll be next Sunday. Heads are still bowed. I don't normally do it, but and I sure I certainly would never embarrass anybody. I would not do that intentionally. I remember this morning. Do you need prayer? Can somebody pray for you that you'll come to Christ? That things would change in your life. That something would happen. Are you going to wait too long? Please don't. Please don't. Pastor, if you come, thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you, Brother Jackie. Stand, please, everybody, would you? <clears throat> Heard a message this morning about new beginnings. This is our theme for the month of March. This is a new beginning. Maybe you need a new beginning in your marriage, maybe in your business, Amen. maybe your personal life, Amen. maybe your spiritual life, like he's talking about. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. Old things are passed away. All things have become new, right? Amen. God gives us a new name and a new home. It's all new. It's all new. I'm, boy, I'm glad to hear that. I made a mess with the old. <laughs> I don't want to take the old with me any further. Amen. Let's just do this uh, together. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just give you the blessing of the day and then just ask you to go in God's peace. And one thing I'd like for you to do before you get out of here is make a friend. Would you do that? It's not hard to do. It doesn't cost you anything. Just take a moment. And greet someone, make them feel, you know, make them feel welcome with a smile and a greeting. Don't just walk past them like, like you're mad at the world, but take the time to greet somebody, okay? And uh, let them know that you care about them, and I know God will bless that. 
Are you ready for the blessing of the day? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his face upon you, give you, be gracious unto you, give you his peace. May angels go before you and goodness and mercy follow you all the days of your life. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you, everybody. Thank you, Jackie, for a great word. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Good, good, good. Good stuff.